The idea of forecasting a volcanic eruption isn't very hard to get your hands around. I mean, I, I, that makes sense. I understand what the, what the goal is. But especially given the amount of activity over the last number of years, what I'd like to do tonight is provide a glimpse into the process. What's, what's the raw data? What, what kinds of evidence are people using to come to these sorts of conclusions? What are the techniques? And we'll even glimpse a little bit at maybe the, the decision-making process, because it isn't always crystal clear, uh, or at least as crystal clear as we would like it to be. So the, uh, the picture here is actually of a Bismiani volcano. It's in Russia, but if you walk out the Aleutians, if you kind of hop, skip, and jump your way out to the Aleutians, and then uh, the first spot that you hit in Russia is basically right here. And I chose it for the slide because it actually, uh, today, on uh, you know, February 16th, 2010, uh, is showing all the signs, showing the sorts of indications that we expect uh, prior to eruption. And we have a long-standing uh, project going on at Bismiani, so we are uh, we're watching uh, intently. So yeah, I was going to start off with a little trivia here and uh, ask you about, I've got uh, seven volcanoes circled here on the map, and so the easy question was, which of these have erupted in the last five years? And you can guess now, but uh, actually, it, it's in fact all of them. Uh, all of these volcanoes have erupted. Is there anyone in the audience who can actually name all seven? Yeah, if so, you should probably be up here, and I'll take your seat. Uh, I confess there were volcanoes on this list that I didn't know of before they erupted. That's what the Aleutians are like. Uh, I want to just scroll through these, give you a little sampling of what's gone on, give you a little taste for uh, recent activity. So yes, all of them have erupted. Um, starting from the west out here and moving eastward, we first encounter Kasatochi. This is uh, an eruption in August 2008. A diminutive little island. It's just the, 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 the summit of a much larger uh, submarine uh, structure out there. And it's, yeah, a very small, but a massive eruption. Uh, by some measures, it was the largest eruption in the world in the 15 years uh, that preceded it. So it's a, just a tremendous eruption. Cleveland, I like to think of Cleveland as sort of the bad boy of Aleutian volcanoes. Uh, it's unmonitored. We don't have any sort of instrumentation around the island. Most of what we know about Cleveland eruptions comes from satellite-based techniques. This photo, uh, which circulated a couple of years ago, came from the International Space Station, actually. This was taken with a handheld camera. It's just a stunning uh, photo. Akmak. Akmak's an amazing uh, volcano. This caldera, I, I guess I've got to pick a screen to use the pointer on here. I'll probably just be all over the place. But this caldera, this depression in the center of Akmak volcano was so big that if you took Fairbanks and draped it over Akmak, downtown would all fit over here. The university, Farmer's Loop, would all fit up in here. There's actually still room for the airport down in this corner, and a little bit of the Tanana River would even sneak through there. So it's a, it's a huge, an absolutely massive depression uh, structure there in the volcano. Pavlov, by some measures, the most frequently erupting volcano in North America. We expect regular eruptions there, and uh, it, it didn't disappoint in uh, August of 2007. Four peaked down in the Katmai region. Prior to its September 2006 eruption, most of us didn't even think it was capable of erupting. We thought of it as the, the, the remnants of a dormant uh, volcano, but uh, surprised everyone. Augustine, we love Augustine. Augustine is a, it's a wonderful, I, I think of Augustine as a textbook volcano. It behaves the way we would like. It has eruptions every decade, every couple of decades. It gives nice warning signs. It's very clear to see when eruptions are coming. It even looks like a wonderful sort of textbook volcano, just beautiful flanks and everything. So it's a favorite, uh, uh, certainly, of mine. Uh, and readout, the readout eruption earlier, uh, well, just a little under a year ago in early 2006. Most people here probably know it, uh, at least from the news, if, if you weren't directly impacted. And uh, I'll draw lots of examples tonight from readout. So these volcanoes here span eh, more than 2,000 miles as you head out the Aleutians. 
Here's a map, a little bit complicated, but essentially all the volcanoes of interest, that is the volcanoes which are actively monitored or those that have erupted recently are on here. And what you see is a lot of them. Right? All, through, all out the Aleutians there. And the, the take home point from this slide, all I really want you to appreciate is that these, all of these volcanoes interact with people, interact with society in some way. The volcanoes towards the eastern end of the arc, well, they frequently dump ash on the Kenai Peninsula, Kodiak, sometimes in Anchorage. On rare occasions, we'll see ash in Fairbanks. As you move further out into the Aleutians, you have the Aleutian communities and the industries associated uh, with those towns. And then, of course, you have the aviation hazard. If you were in this forum uh, a year ago, uh, Peter Webley gave a very nice talk which focused a lot on aviation hazards and the specific threats to the trans-Pacific uh, airline routes that not everyone fully appreciates, uh, mostly cross over the North Pacific. And that's a hazard which extends, is equally uh, pervasive from volcanoes really all along the arc. So the point is all of these have the potential to, uh, to cause harm to people, to impact communities, and to, uh, to inf have economic uh, impacts. So we want to know something about eruptions at them. So eruptions can be expensive. They can be inconvenient. That's, that's really a gross understatement. I need a stronger word in there. Uh, and they can be deadly. Okay? So that's the problem. But it turns out they're fairly easy to avoid, especially in Alaska. Because unlike many parts of the world, we don't have hundreds of thousands of people living on the slopes at high elevation up Mount Spur. If someone says, stay away from Coravin Volcano, well, by and large, that's something we have the flexibility uh, of doing. So all we need in order to do that is a good forecast. So if we know about an eruption before it's going to happen, we say, stay away. It's not that hard. Um, it's best if you know about eruptions beforehand. You don't want to know about an eruption you know, firsthand as it's beginning. This is an, an amazing slide. Uh, this was taken at Readout last year. This is a so-called pyroclastic flow. Think of it as a hot, ashy avalanche that's come tearing down from the summit of Readout, and uh, it's just emerging from below the cloud layer. It's coming at the camera at speeds somewhere uh, probably in excess of 100 miles an hour and would have overtaken this camera in a matter of seconds. This wasn't taken by a person. It was a, you know, a stationary insta remote installation. But uh, this is the wrong time to find out about an eruption. Ideally, you want to know beforehand. And that's where the forecasting, uh, that's where the forecasting part comes in. So here's my volcanic eruption forecast for 2010. It's not that hard. Okay? This, is, this is a perfectly accurate, robust forecast that I'm going to give you. You might want to get a pen. There's a two-thirds chance of a significant volcanic eruption in Alaska in 2010. That's, that's true. I can back that up with statistics. I can show you everything that went into that. That's an absolutely valid forecast. Well, it's not of much use, right? unless you're just going to avoid Alaska altogether or something. Uh, in order to be of any use, you need more specifics. We want to pinpoint a little more detail, at flush this out with, first of all, some locations. What are we talking about? What volcanoes? Then we want to know something about, well, when. A year is kind of too big a bracket. We'd like a narrower time window. And then equally important, what, what kinds of behavior might we expect? Is this something we really need to worry about, or is it just a little piddly burst or something? So those, are the th those three details, where, when, and how, are what drive most of this process, most of what we do going into forecast is, is an attempt to reconcile those and provide something that's of more use than that forecast right there. I was at Lathrop High School a few weeks ago, and I got kind of roughed up over this slide. The kids teased me about it, but I have to show it anyway. It's kind of simplistic, but it, I think it illustrates quite nicely the process that uh, re really does summarize most of our research. You are probably aware of the Geophysical Institute. That's where I work. And the group of people that I work with uh, are largely devoted to, uh, yeah, I think it's a fairly simple process, trying to take raw observations of all different kinds of data sources, whatever kind of data we can get our hands on, 
Tie that with actual eruptive behavior. What's, what's happening at the volcano? Put those two together. And then turn those into products. Turn those into forecasts that can be used effectively and turn them into monitoring tools. And that, uh, I really think those three topics there pretty much uh, cover the, you know, our, um, our mandate, uh, if you will. The last part of this process, particularly the monitoring and the, uh, the, the forecast part, is done under the auspices of the Alaska Volcano Observatory. Uh, I'll give a shout out to our partner agencies, the Alaska Department of Geological and Geophysical Surveys and the U.S. Geological Survey. Together, these three organizations are charged with providing uh, a, a number of services, but uh, continuous monitoring is certainly key among them. Even though I'm here right now talking, there are systems in place and people in place so that we have, you know, we provide continuous monitoring over as many volcanoes as we can. A lot of instrumentation deployed remotely all around the state is required in order to do that. So the maintenance and the upkeep of that uh, system takes a considerable amount of effort. We're always involved in the development of new techniques. Uh, and then the end goal of all of this is public alerts. That's, the, that's sort of the objective. That's the, the, uh, the end product of what much of what we do. And a lot of what goes on uh, is, is an attempt to, to come to a decision when, do we, when is it time to alert people, alert agencies, alert industry, all of that. Uh, that's, that's really our end goal. We have a very simple uh, advisory watch warning sort of system to communicate hazards. There's also an aviation color code. I think it's relatively self-explanatory, green, yellow, orange, red. You get the basic idea. Um, what I want to do in the next number of slides is give you a sample of the different kinds of thinking, the different kinds of science, the different kinds of ideas that come together in order to do this kind of thing. Um, volcanology is a wonderfully interdisciplinary field. Uh, from chemistry to physics to just about every kind of earth science out there, there's really a role for all sorts of groups. And uh, it really is most effective when it's done that way. So I want to just walk through a few ideas, a few different techniques, each of which has its own specialists and uh, ideas that are uh, used in, oops, let's go back to this one. The first one would be gas chemistry. As magmas contain a lot of gas. As they reach the surface, they tend to give off those gases. The demonstration in the back corner with the baking soda and vinegar is certainly a nice illustration of that. Uh, not unlike uncorking a champagne bottle. Is there anyone here who's uh, just here for extra credit in their high school science class? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not like a bottle of, it's not like uncorking champagne. It's like opening a bottle of mineral water. And it'll fizz and uh, release all the gases from it. But um, this slide's a little, a little complicated. The details aren't really important. But the key thing is that magmas have certain chemical signatures, particularly sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, things that we might not see in plain old steam. So when you see a steam plume from a volcano, we could ask the question, does this cloud have the chemical signature, the signature that suggests that there's actually magma in the shallow surface beneath it? And you can do that by sampling the gas directly or some really clever techniques that you can use remotely that make sense of, uh, that make uh, use of light and uh, the spectra of different uh, chemicals and whatnot. So that's an important tool in the arsenal. Uh, a really elegant technique that's become uh, uh, really come of age in the last 15, 20 years or into broad use particularly is the use of deformation. The idea being whenever you bring a bunch of magma into the shallow surface, it's got to expand. It's, it's got to go somewhere. You have to make room for it. So compare this slide to the next one. And the idea is quite simple. As this magma comes in, you should be able to see this in changes on the surface. So there's a little animation someone pointed me to the other day that I kind of like. Uh, and it reminds me a lot of breathing. And you can tell if someone's breathing just by looking at their chest, right? And you see, in, out. A little bit hokey, but I think it's a nice, uh, it's actually kind of a nice analogy. And so by measuring the s changes on the surface of the earth, we can infer the presence of new magmas at depth. 
We do that uh, at a number of Alaskan volcanoes with the use of GPS networks. So these are rather sophisticated GPS stations. They're using the same GPS signal that we, uh, you, know, you might use in your car, or your handheld, or whatever. But they're using it in a different way where they can actually use it to very high precision, getting easily detecting measurements on the scale of centimeters, even millimeters. So this particular photograph, which is at Mount Spur, kind of illustrates what one of these stations looks like. And over the course of months to years, we can see changes, again, on the scale of centimeters easily uh, from these stations. And that's become a, a very nice tool uh, of late, particularly. One of the techniques that we've grown to uh, be quite dependent on recently, particularly in Alaska, is remote sensing. That is, the use of satellite data. This is an example. This is an uh, not an illustration. It's, a, it's an image of the Cook Inlet area taken from space, from a satellite. The uh, volcanoes are all labeled there. And when you take a photograph, uh, a digital image, rather, you have a choice of what kind of light you're going to be uh, sensitive to. And you may choose to take a, an image that's sensitive to visible light. If you take that image uh, with a, in, in a way that's more sensitive to infrared light, then you can infer something about temperature. Temperature, or infrared, uh, heat, uh, you know, closely connected. So we're going to zoom in on readout here. And remember, this is a digital image. So if we blow this up enough, there's actually pixels in there, individual pixels. And on this image, I, I forget, I can't remember if the pixels are half a kilometer or a kilometer, but somewhere around that. And this is a digital image that's been draped over the topography of readout. You see it's mostly, uh, mostly dark. And there's that one really bright pixel right in the middle and a little bit uh, off to the side there. Since this is taken in the infrared band, that corresponds to a very hot patch of Earth. Now, this is a very big area we're talking about. It looks small on the image, but something a kilometer on a side or whatnot. And it's not easy to heat up the summit of a mountain in April in coastal Alaska. Everything should be snow covered. So when you see an area like this where the temperature is many tens of degrees above the surrounding area, you've got a fairly telltale sign. This particular image was actually taken after the eruption, the readout eruption, and you might well expect that the ground should be hot following an eruption. But if you see this prior to an eruption, then really almost the only way to do that is to have magma in very close proximity to the surface. The geologic history is, of course, a, a, a critical component of understanding any sort of volcanic system. It does a couple of things for us. Uh, understanding the geology of a volcano tells us what it's capable of. You're essentially digging through the past. I kind of liken this to dumpster diving at a volcano. Uh, you're going through really the trash, all the products that have been ejected in perhaps over the last decades, the centuries, or millennia, trying to understand, one, what kinds of eruptions does this volcano create? What might we expect from it? And the second thing is putting to piecing together a timeline. So knowing when it erupts, knowing if it's a very frequently erupting volcano or if it just does its thing on very rare occasions is a critical piece of information in putting together any sort of accurate forecast. There are also historical records. This timeline here was actually compiled by going through historical records uh, which are not tremendously deep in Alaska, but if you look hard enough, there's a few hundred years worth of history buried in ship logs, diaries, uh, newspapers in some cases, uh, reports of this nature. And if you have a fairly comprehensive search of these, you can piece together, again, the historical record of eruptions. Really critical tool. The last thing I want to focus on and spend much of the rest of the talk on is earthquakes. That's my particular uh, angle or my particular contribution uh, in this. And um, what I want you to think about, this is a rather random photograph of Augustine Volcano, but I want you to appreciate just how much material comes out of a volcano during an eruption. So Augustine Island is something like 10 kilometers across. This isn't even a, an eruption per se. This is mostly a, a, just a giant steam uh, event. But even so, there's a tremendous amount of material were this actually a full eruption, you wouldn't even be able to see the island right now, most likely. Um, and we're fortunate 
Because it turns out you can't really move a lot of mass, whether it's magma or anything else, you can't move a lot of mass around on the Earth without making a lot of noise, without causing a lot of ground vibration. And so we make extensive use of this uh, around volcanoes because, well, we can record, we record the ground vibrations. L let me give you an analogy. Um, when a gravel truck drives down my road, I don't even need to look out the window. I, I know we have a lot of gravel trucks going by. They've been building cabins the last few years. And it rattles the house. It rattles the house. I feel the vibrations. I know a gravel truck just went down the road. Even a modest Aleutian eruption is the equivalent of something like a few million, a parade of a few million gravel trucks going by. If you work out the amount of material coming out. So that's a tremendous amount of ground shaking. Most of the eruptions that we work with uh, ha are preceded, that is before the eruption, have vibrations, have earthquakes, and sometimes a volcanic tremor um, that is visible tens of kilometers away, if not hundreds of kilometers away. That's our, that's our parade of gravel trucks. So there's a, we, make, we make extensive use of that. It works to our advantage. Uh, here's a nice little illustration of how we record ground motion. On the left, there's a Silly little cartoon, but watch as the table shakes, right? It shakes back and forth, and the little pen jiggles and uh, writes on the paper. That's what the demo back there in the corner uh, was doing for those of you who might have seen. On the right-hand side, this is a real uh, seismograph drum here with a little uh, needle recording. You can see a little earthquake coming in uh, right now. And while, of course, the instrumentation we use now looks a little different than this, and it's digital, and we don't any longer have little pens on pieces of paper. But the ideas are exactly the same. And the physics really hasn't changed at all. In fact, it hasn't changed. So um, our version of the data now looks something like this. This would be what we call it, referred to as a seismogram. It's quite easy to read. This one's 15 seconds long. Where you see it flatlined, there's no earthquake. Where you see the motion up and down, um, there's an earthquake. So really not that hard. Um, to accomplish this, to record this, there are oh, somewhere on the order of 400 seismic stations around the state of Alaska with many different purposes. Many of them are there to record just the earthquake activity that's common in Alaska. About half of them are centered on volcanoes, uh, such as this one here. The vast majority are in very remote places. These are places where the only power is solar power, batteries, uh, that kind of thing. They do have radios inside. That data, if it doesn't come back in real time, if it's not available for people to view near instantaneously, then it's not of a lot of use if it just gets stored um, in here. So you're unlikely to come across one of these in your travels. Maybe you have at some point, but they are really, a, they do tend to be remote. If you do stumble on one, do me a favor. Don't shoot the solar panels. <laughs> they look like a nice target and all, but really, it's like hitting the side of a barn. It's not a challenge. So leave them be, please, and uh, it'll make our lives a lot easier. So here's another seismogram, uh, a little bit more complicated, but this is a, a, easy, a fairly easy to read. This is 24 hours long, and it reads just like a book. You start in the upper left corner. You read across one line. In this case, there's half, a, there's half an hour on line. Then you go down to the next one. You can look all through the day. This particular piece of data was taken from readout last year. And what you see, what it shows, is lots of little small earthquakes. These are maybe magnitude 1. There's probably a few magnitude, maybe a few magnitude 2s in there. These are little earthquakes. It's different. We're used to thinking in terms of a single large earthquake. Much of what we work with at volcanoes is, in fact, lots of little earthquakes. Think of just earth breaking and breaking and shattering as, as magma and gas and steam moves through it. So when we have lots of little earthquakes, we refer to this as an earthquake swarm. And we're very fortunate. It turns out almost all eruptions are preceded by some sort of vigorous seismic activity. More often than not, there are swarms. Often there is, uh, again, this... Uh, volcanic tremor, um, and this is something that we exploit uh, considerably. You know, almost all eruptions uh, have this. So here's an example. Here's a three-day seismogram now. I wonder whose kid that could be. Three days long. 
It's a nice illustration. This is March, begins March 20th uh, last year, and this is from Readout, and it basically shows the buildup to the first explosive eruption of Readout last year. In the first day, there are very few earthquakes. 24 hours later, we see a considerable uptick. There's lots of these little discrete uh, events, several of them per hour. One day later, we see a large number of earthquakes, lots of earthquakes. You see where this is going, one, two, three, and building those saturated lines down on the bottom, right there, late in the day on March 20th. These are the signals associated with the first explosive eruption. Kicked ash up into the air many tens of thousands of feet. Uh, and here we have a wonderful representation of everything that happened in the three days prior to that eruption. That is the difference from here to there between going from this, this is readout prior to the eruption, note the nice snowy flanks, to after the eruption. This was taken just a few days after this, and everything you see is covered in ash. Again, this is winter, so everything beforehand was covered in snow. So th all of that, that's what happened uh, before and after the eruption. And here we have a three-day record of many of the details, all the, many of the interesting things that happened in that buildup. So this is tremendously useful for us. We've been through a whole bunch of techniques. All of these come together in a perfect world, right? All six of these kinds of things would point in one direction, unequivocally, bleh, unequivocally saying eruption, eruption. Of the real world, I'm a little tongue-tied this evening. The real world is a little more complicated. On a good day, maybe we have two or three of these. Much of what we do in attempting to make sense of this, in attempting to put together an accurate forecast, is trying to weigh the relative merits of each of these. Which of these uh, on that particular day is a robust sign? Which one is nah, a little bit iffy? And uh, which ones don't agree at all? And uh, this involves specialists from each one of these fields. And uh, putting all this together, you, you attempt to make uh, sense of it. I want to single out, though, these, uh, this seismic uh, approach. I don't think I'll be offending any of my colleagues if I suggest that seismology occupies kind of a unique role in uh, volcanology and particularly prior to eruptions, particularly in the buildup. And it all comes back to what we saw on the slide just a minute ago, this idea that most all eruptions are preceded by some sort of notable seismic activity. It may take just a few hours, it may take days, it may be months, but it's very rare not to have something here to work with. So what I'd like to tell you is that we have the problem solved. You rest easy, all you got to do then, since we know that eruptions always are preceded by some kind of activity, all you got to do is record seismic data from this volcano, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and all the way down the arc, and you're done. If you see a bunch of seismic activity, you issue a forecast, it's going to erupt, end of story. And again, it isn't quite that simple. There's one big problem with this thinking. There's one flaw in my logic, which sometimes I'll admit, sometimes I won't. Uh, and it looks something, I'll illustrate it something like this. This is the process that we're trying to find. This process here, this movement of magma toward the surface, and we've said that you really can't do this without generating a lot of seismic activity. This is your, this is your parade of millions of gravel trucks. You're going to hear it. The problem is this. There's a lot of other things going on on these mountains. These are very active places. You've got vigorous hydrothermal or geothermal systems on many of these mountains. In Alaska, Many of our volcanoes have glaciers on top. Glaciers are incredibly noisy. Most of these mountains, from a structural standpoint, are really rotten. Half of them are collapsing under their own weight. They're new. These mountains weren't here a few millennia ago or whatever, depending on the mountain. So there, many are collapsing. Rock slides are very common. Avalanches. We then have all of the events, all of the magmatic events, where magma comes into the crust, it's moving up to the surface, going gangbusters, and then it just stalls. Some people call these failed eruptions. I'm an optimist. I like to call them successful intrusions. <laughs> Those magmas can sit around. They can degas over years, in some cases perhaps even centuries. 
So you might have significant gas that works its way up, makes lots of seismic noise, but there's no magma moving. And then we have what I might call uh, good old-fashioned earthquakes. Earthquakes that are just happening, they just happen to be somewhere near the volcano. So all of these things conspire to mask or to complicate our understanding of the signals that we're really after. So just a little thought experiment. These are, these are made up numbers, but I think they're fairly representative. Let's just say that for every real bona fide eruption, we have 10 interesting events. I was putting up a little thought experiment here. Let's just assume that for every eruption, there are 10 other interesting kinds of events. Eh, these are your rock slides, your intrusions, your geothermal activity, all of that. And let's be conservative. Let's say that most of those we can rule out right away. We know what they are. Let's say just one third of them have signals that we might in some way confuse for precursory eruptive activity. If you're willing to accept those numbers and you work that through, what that means is that three out of four times you'll be wrong. It means three quarters of your events will, in fact, not have anything to do or not be precursory to an eruption. And if you're in the business of forecasting, three out of four times wrong is absolutely unacceptable. We all know the story of the little boy that cried wolf, and uh, that's, we don't want to be the little boy that cried wolf. So much of what we do is centered on trying to sift out and sort out these various processes so that we can tell this from that and from that from that and that and isolate particularly uh, these here. This matters. Forecasts matter and forecasts that are wrong do damage. What I'd like to do in the last few minutes here is walk you through three examples, three recent examples uh, and take a look at the forecasts that were made and the, the, the uh, events that followed and try and uh, convey to you why it mattered, why these forecasts are important, and why we want to strive hard to... Um, I, I will tell you, we do better than one out of four. We do. But uh, why this is an important thing uh, for us to pursue. Okay. Here's a nice example. This is a fresh example. It's about data that's a little less than two months old. On the left-hand side, this is data from December 26th. On the right-hand side, this is data from December 28th. This is from Readout, I should point out. And uh, while this looks like nice background activity, over the, uh, on, the, on uh, December 28th, we started seeing lots of little events, lots of little quakes that looked like that. In fact, there were quite a lot of them. Um, we have an internal discussion group, uh, an online forum that we use uh, in AVO to try and hash out these kinds of details. And I'm going to read to you a, a, a post, uh, an internal post from this. Quote, it is hard to envision this as anything other than a reactivation of the magmatic system. Ooh, these are strong words. I believe a magmatic plug is actively moving in the readout conduit. It could be possible to have a dome collapse without any other sign, though a thermal anomaly or GPS deflation at depth would be telltale. Well, this person was not alone. Uh, some other folks concurred with this. Based on this data, we went to a night watch schedule to make sure that we weren't missing anything. We raised the color code at readout from green to yellow. It's a modest increase. No one, is, no one went on record saying an eruption is imminent or anything like that. But it said, hey, we're paying close attention. You guys have been reading the news. You know what's going on. Has anything happened at readout in the last six weeks? No, nah, nothing. Nothing happened at all. After a few days, this activity subsided. It went away. End of story. Yeah, I'd hate to be the person who wrote this, but that, that, that was me. <laughs> I, I wrote those words. Um, on December 29th, it was my earnest opinion. My, mind you, I did more than look at this. I ran a bunch of nerdy tests on the data and ran it through all the kinds of algorithms that we use and whatnot. And uh, it was my earnest opinion that these were, in fact, magmatic, that these represented a rejuvenation of what we had seen at readout last spring. Um, clearly, that wasn't really the right call. And this probably isn't an example I should be airing in public. But I think it's a nice example. It shows, it gives you an, an honest look at some of the challenges, some of the pitfalls uh, of what we're facing. This is, in some sense, what we're up against. So, moving along, I want to touch on Casatochi. 
in August of 2008. So Kasatochi, uh, prior to the eruption, th this, is, this photo was taken after, prior to the eruption, Kasatochi had lush green slopes. Uh, it was a common stopover place for migrating birds through the western Aleutians. In, uh, yeah, in early August, there were two U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, researchers who were on the island. They were doing bird surveys. And uh, for a number of days, they had felt small tremors. And they had radioed this in to their friends or their colleagues or who were off island. Uh, Kasatochi is not monitored in any proper sense. Again, there's no instrumentation on the island. We are fortunate. We have uh, a volcano about 40 kilometers away, which does have a seismic network. On uh, August 5th, earthquakes were sufficiently large that we began to locate them. And for the first time, we could say, ah, those actually are coming from the Kasatochi region. They're not necessarily off somewhere else. They're, they're somewhere very close to uh, Kasatochi. On August 6th, the rate of those earthquakes increased considerably, as did the size of them. And that was sufficient cause for concern that uh, the color code uh, was raised to yellow at readout. About that time, a fairly significant evacuation effort involving the Coast Guard and a few other groups uh, was mounted to try and get those two researchers off of the island. Uh, there was a very large earthquake uh, early on August 7th, uh, magnitude 5.6 associated with that's That's real. That's big enough to be recorded globally. Early in the morning, late in the morning rather, on the 7th, the team was evacuated, and a few hours later, uh, Kasatochi erupted in really just a huge eruption, as I said, um, by many measures the biggest eruption in uh, a decade or two. So this is an example where good forecasts count. They matter. In some cases, forecasts save lives. The second example I want to use is, uh, is from Colima Volcano. This is in Mexico, but it's a place where I've been fortunate to work a uh, fair amount over the last number of years. And uh, Colima is another one of these textbook volcanoes. It's just it's beautiful to look at, these wonderful sides, which are just covered in uh, ash and uh, rock debris, largely from these kind of modest little eruptions, very picturesque, really. You make postcards out of this kind of stuff. Once every hundred years or so, Colima is capable of a much bigger uh, eruption. The last big eruption uh, at Colima was in 1913, and many signs point toward the, a build-up to this next, quote-unquote, big uh, eruption. I want to zoom in on the left flank of Colima, and I want you to notice, it's a little hard to see, but as you come down these slopes, there's kind of a natural funnel right here. This is a, a, a point where much of the material, much of the debris that comes down here naturally goes into this little gully here, this channel, which looks little but actually is very massive. It's big enough that there are several towns that are built uh, in this valley because, well, it's a very lush little tropical valley, kind of a nice place to be. One of those towns is called La Yerba Buena. This is a photograph taken from La Yerba Buena looking back at the volcano. Uh, and there are two things to note. One is that the volcano just towers over the town. And the second one is that, again, this, this lush tropical sort of forest covers much of the evidence that you might otherwise know uh, of, of what goes on in this valley. So it turns out uh, that La Yerba Buena is built on the remains of a catastrophic flow of debris and rock that came down in the big 1913 eruption. La Yerba Buena is a bad place to be when there's a big eruption at Colima. It's hard to see. It's kind of hidden. There are signs, though. This is a picture I took uh, in town. Uh, this is, mind you, La Yerba Buena was built in the 1960s, so 50 years after the big eruption, and at the time it was not appreciated uh, what this area was capable of. But there are signs like this. There are boulders like this all around town that the town was just built around. This photo is great because they wanted to build a sidewalk here. So they just, they just moved the sidewalk out a foot or two, left the rock there, and built the sidewalk uh, around it. And when Kalima became active again in the 90s, people started walking around here going, well, wait a sec, this is not supposed to be there. That's not what, I don't have rocks like this in my yard. Uh, and they're, in fact, littered all around town. So as they pieced this together, they realized the hazards that this town faces. So when the activity picked up in 1999 and through 2001, they evacuated La Yerba Buena five times. Five times the military came in 
helped people move. Everyone left the town for days to weeks because they were unclear. Well, there was, there was evidence that maybe uh, Colima was going to have a big eruption. Um, that's a big impact on a community. When you take people out of their homes, you take them away from their jobs. In this case, you take them away from their livestock. You take them away from their crops. That has very real impacts. Um, but you take them out of school, all of these. So th here's a community that was evacuated five times. Um, they have yet to have this big eruption. There's every reason to think it's coming. Uh, nothing's changed there. But it hasn't happened. So they got tired of evacuating, obviously. And uh, they actually got funds. They were built a new town. So several kilometers away, they came in, and everyone was given a fairly rudimentary concrete block house, but in fact, a, a place to live. Uh, there were nine families that said, no, we're not leaving. This is a woman I met in La Yerba Buena, and she explained in very clear terms. She said, look, I was evacuated five times, and nothing ever happened. Why should I believe them now? And in some sense, she has a point. It's hard to argue against that. Um, so this is an unfortunate situation. Um, I wouldn't say that the forecasts were wrong, but it's a, yeah, an unfortunate forecast. Let's put it that way. Because now they're in a situation where many people simply don't believe what they hear from the scientists. So this is a case, I think, where forecasts have a direct impact on communities and on, uh, yeah, and on the people who live there. And the last example I want to touch on is more of an economic one. This is from the readout eruption uh, last year. This is a great satellite image. It's about 60 kilometers from end to end. And what you're seeing, this is, uh, this is readout. This was taken in April sometime, I believe. Uh, you see puffy steam clouds above uh, readout. This is steaming after uh, a notable eruption. And you see that steam drifting off across Cook Inlet toward the Kenai Peninsula. And you see ash deposits all over the snow here from the previous eruption. So all that area has been covered by ash, much like in the photo we saw a little while ago. Off to the north, you see the Drift River Valley. This is another one of those natural funnels, one of these uh, 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 structures which tends to capture most of the material that comes down from the summit area. This would be equivalent, La Yerba Buena would be you know, somewhere out in here. Uh, fortunately, we don't have a La Yerba Buena, which is really uh, yeah, something we, we, we are incredibly fortunate of uh, in Alaska. But during the eruptions, all of the summit material, some of it new material, some of it old, and importantly, all of the water that melts from all the snow. You take hot magma, you mix it with snow, you get a lot of water. So all of this sediment, all this material, which is very water-rich, uh, runs down. This is 40 kilometers from readout out to the end. You see it fan out. This fan is 12 kilometers across. And you even see it entering Cook Inlet uh, here. Now I'm going to zoom in on an area whoop, right here. This is the Drift River Oil Terminal. You might have read about this uh, in the newspapers. This is a facility which uh, there are, you can see seven oil tanks right there, capable of holding a few tens of millions of uh, gallons of crude. And their purpose is quite simple. There are oil platforms out in Cook Inlet that need to pump continuously to be efficient. The Drift River Oil Terminal allows a buffer. It allows storage capacity so that tankers can come in periodically while the uh, platforms pump continuously. And this is actually a, a success story by most measures. You take a look at this, and though you see these, these so-called lahar deposits all around, you'll notice that the facility itself there is in, is in great shape. This is a nice example of history being important. In the 1989 eruption, it was made clear what the, what the vulnerabilities were here. And they embarked on a very serious effort to build berms uh, around it. And clearly, uh, it did a very nice job uh, in protecting the, uh, the, the storage tanks this time around. Some of the outer lying areas didn't fare as well. They weren't quite as protected. This is an airstrip down here. And I'm going to zoom in. The next photo shows some of the outlying buildings. And this is the debris. This is the material in these lahars. It looks kind of like mud, but it's not. These are whole trees here, many of which have come tens of kilometers uh, to get there. So this is, some serious, uh, this is some serious stuff. Needless to say, it shut down the, uh, the oil terminal. Uh, because of that, because the terminal was shut down, the oil platforms out in Cook Inlet had to be shut down as well. They were offline for 
uh, uh, entirely for four months and then came back on fairly slowly. Um, this has impacts. Uh, this is a rather gutsy move in April. On April 29th, a uh, super tanker actually came in, pulled up next to the Drift River oil terminal just as a safety precaution to take the last remaining crude out of those tanks, just in case something did go wrong. You don't want to have oil uh, mixed up in it. And uh, one of the reasons that this could happen, this was during the eruption. I mean, th there wasn't an active eruption going on, but during the eruption period, um, the thinking was that there was enough good, there was enough monitoring going on, there would be enough lead time, enough warning that folks who were at the oil terminal uh, carrying out this maneuver and whatnot would be able to, uh, would be able to, you know, uh, evacuate and get on their way. So, um, uh, yeah, I see this as a, as a success story, uh, but not one without impacts. The, uh, the uh, oil production was suspended for four months. A very conservative estimate, something like $45 million in lost revenue. From a selfish perspective, that's like $5.5 million in state royalties. Uh, again, minimum estimates you can pull from the papers. But um, there's very real consequences. On the airline side, I'm sure there are people in this room who were affected by the readout eruption. I was. Alaska Airlines canceled 295 flights, something like 20,000 people uh, were impacted by those cancellations. Ted Stevens International Airport reported losing $2 million. Uh, some of the service companies, the airline service companies, including UPS, furloughed, uh, not just uh, service companies, but companies dependent on the airlines, uh, furloughed employees. Uh, many of the cargo flights were routed elsewhere, some of them permanently. That's a loss. Uh, Elmendorf moved uh, a number of people in planes out of state. Um, None of these are good things. These all hurt us. These all have economic impacts. And frankly, these can't necessarily be avoided. Uh, what I would point out is that good forecasts, because readout was uh, generous, if you will, and giving several months of uh, lead-up time, allowed for advanced plans to be made here. Elmendorf evacuated something like six weeks before the eruption. Uh, not all of Elmendorf, but this, this component. Um, this is a quote here from the Director of Operations uh, of Alaska Airlines. I won't read the whole thing, but it says here, uh, in his quote, nearly, for nearly two months, volcanologists had warned that seismic activity at readout would likely lead to uh, an eruption. He goes on to state that that allowed them to make, that allowed them several weeks to make contingency plans. So yes, they had to cancel their 295 flights, but when readout really did erupt, they had a binder full of response plans. This is what we will do in this scenario because they had had weeks uh, to prepare. So I think uh, while we can't entirely mitigate the economic impacts, the forecast, a good forecast, certainly allows us to uh, be better prepared uh, for it. So I think that's about it. I'm, I'm going to wrap up here in the next couple slides. Um, points I wanted to make here, what I think the take-home points are that Forecasts count. This is not, these should not be thought of as kind of, uh, you know, obscure academic kinds of uh, endeavors. These are things, these forecasts feed directly back into the community, in some cases saving lives, preparing communities, and almost always uh, helping us address the economic impacts or at least uh, plan for them. So this is our uh, motivation. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice area to work in. I don't lack for motivation uh, in what we do. I'll just touch quickly again on what I like to call the volcano seismology dilemma. This idea that eruptions almost always give us some sort of advance notice. However, we have a hard time. We can't always infer that this means that. This, is a, this remains a challenge for us. It remains our, uh, uh, one of the driving factors in our, uh, in our, our research. So. I won't go on, I could go on for hours and hours about some of our specific research details, but let me summarize it with two bullet points. Most everything we do is targeted, uh, this is from the, the seismology sort of perspective, two goals. One of them is trying to distinguish between all of these different sources, trying to understand these mechanics and these mechanisms with the end goal of trying to sort out particularly which ones are these right here. And then the second bullet point is to do this in a fast way. It's one thing to take five years during a PhD program and come up with a conclusion to how you would interpret some particular data. It's a very different thing to have that at 3 o'clock in the morning when an alarm goes off and says, hey, you've got seismic activity at X volcano, 
to not just have the alert, but to have an initial run at processing this, to have some interpretation sitting there as you stumble out of bed over to the cell phone to see your, uh, your alarm message, to try and see, have some of that initial analysis already done. And those two points pretty much summarize everything that goes on, I think, uh, in our lab. So that's it. Uh, I'll end with a nice, nice uh, readout shot here.